Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a delight to be together this morning to worship our God. May the Lord bless us and also welcome to any guests worshiping with us. The consistory has the following announcements. Sister Nadia Schouten has requested an attestation to the Canadian Reformed Church at St. Albert. And Brother Declan Vector has requested an attestation to the Canary Reform Church at Coaldale. May the Lord be with them there in their congregations, in their new congregations. And also, due to the retirement from office of Brothers A. De Vink, M. Huxema, and C. Workman, as elders and E. Nedervein and S. van Leeuwen as deacons, the congregation is requested to suggest names of brothers who would be suitable for the office of elder and deacon by April 9, 2023. Further information and considerations can be found in the bulletin. And the collections today are for Barhead Pregnancy Care Center. Let us now rise for worship and lift up our hearts unto the Lord. Congregation, where does our help come from? Receive now God's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now sing from Psalm 78 to stanzas 1, 3, and 4.
the Lord has given us the rules by which we should conduct ourselves in the ten words of the covenant so that we stay within the boundaries of the law, which is what the sermon is about this morning. And so let us hear what these boundaries are and let us remember that the law is given to us to teach us our sins and also to teach us that we have been delivered from sin through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that we keep the law in thankfulness to what he has done. And then let us respond by singing from Psalm 119, the stanzas 17, 35, and 37. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbors. And the Lord teaches this in a summary. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
Let us now unite in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing over this worship service. O oh Lord, what a privilege it is to be together this morning as your covenant people here in Barhead. We may come together to worship you and have the freedom to do so. Although this world rejects you and your people, in your mercy and compassion you have given us your Holy Spirit to accept your invitation to worship you here and in our homes and in our Christian schools. Father in heaven, we put our hope in you and know that in so doing we will never be put to shame. For you are the God of goodness and uprightness. And you instruct us sinners in your ways. You teach us to be humble and to know what is right in your sight. You teach us how to walk on a straight and narrow path, the path that leads to eternity with you. As long as we desire to keep the demands of your covenant, you will show us that your ways are always loving and faithful. We thank you that this morning we can hear the proclamation of the gospel and read and reflect on a portion of your precious word. You tell us in your word that you confide in those who fear you and that you are gracious to those who are lonely and afflicted. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you also in this past week. And because of this, the troubles of our hearts grieve us. O oh Lord, take away our sins, renew us, guide our lives and rescue us, for we take refuge in you. And be with the members of this congregation, Lord. We thank you for the gift of life and that you grant each and every one of us that we may know, Lord, that you are the one who gives us that life and that our lives are also in your hands. And we thank you that we can celebrate life also with birthdays, Lord, be with Brother Harry Fidelden as he celebrates later on this week. And Lord, grant that we all may give thanks to you for the gift of life, O oh Lord, and that we treasure that gift. And Lord, we ask you to give relief to those who are suffering either physically or mentally. Be with those who are mourning. We especially think of our sister Anita Zielman, whose grandmother passed into, unto eternal glory. What a blessing that we may have the comfort of the knowledge that those who die in the Lord will be with you forever. Bless and console Anita and her family and friends with that knowledge, O Lord. And Father, be with those who are mourning because of death and calamity. We think of the people in Mississippi who were affected by a tornado this past week where whole towns were destroyed and where many people died. And Lord, be with them that they may call upon you, O Lord, and that it may be a reminder to them and to all of us that we must lead lives of repentance for we never know when disaster is going to strike. O oh Lord, but those who call upon you and those who trust in you know that no matter what happens, nothing can separate us from your love. And Lord, grant that this may be known also among those people there. And Lord, we ask you to be with the office bearers. We thank you that they can take up their task in faithfulness to you. Although we're all sinful men, we know that you will bless us as long as we want to follow your ways and be with those who are completing their terms and bless the process of electing and appointing new office bearers. And bless us this morning as we submit ourselves to your word, O Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now sing together from hymn 48, the stanzas 1, 3, and 4.
Let us now read from God's Word as we find it, first of all, in the Gospel according to John, chapter 10, verse 7 through 18, and then we will read from Hosea, chapter 4. First, then, from John 10. This is God's precious Word. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now from Hosea, chapter 4. Again, this is God's word. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love, and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Let no one contend, and let none accuse. For with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day. The prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother." My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. The more they increase, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. And they shall eat, but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore, but not multiply. Because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom, wine and new wine, which takes away understanding. My people inquire of a piece of wood. And their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains and burn offerings on the hills, under oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters play the whore, and your brides commit adultery. I will punish... An 
I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes, and the people without understanding shall come to ruin. And then comes the text, verse 15 and 16. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to beth Avon, and swear not, as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in the broad pasture? And then just the last two verses. Abraham is joined to idols. Leave him alone. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring. Their rulers dearly love shame. A wind has wrapped them in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. So the text is, Though you play the whore, O Israel, let Judah not become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to beth Aven, and swear not as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in the broad pasture? After the sermon, we will sing from Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, all three stanzas. Beloved congregation, brothers and sisters, those who live in cattle country will notice that a cow wanders off every once in a while and gets lost. And if you ask a rancher how a cow gets lost, then the chances are that he will reply, well, a cow starts nibbling on a tuft of green grass, and then when it finishes, it looks ahead to the next tuft of green grass and starts nibbling on that one. And then it nibbles another tuft of grass next to a hole in the fence. If it sees another tuft of grass on the other side of the fence, it nibbles on that one and then gets on to the next tuft. The thing you know, the cow has nibbled itself into being lost. Cows are dumb animals. Like any animal, one of its basic instincts is food. And it wants the luscious grass wherever she can find it. As long as the cow gets what she wants, she is satisfied. The cow likes the freedom to graze wherever the grass is greenest. Cows don't like fences. That's also what we are like, aren't we? Which is what this text of this morning tells us. The Lord God compares the Israelites to stubborn heifers. Israel wants freedom. It wants the freedom to do what she likes, no constraints. And so the Lord warns them that that will be their downfall. By giving Israel that warning, He also gives us that same warning. He warns us about wanting too much freedom. When you have too much freedom, you run the danger of becoming lost, utterly lost. In the end, you may never find your way back again, and you'll be lost forever. And that's the curse of a life without boundaries, of too much freedom. That's also the theme for this morning's service. It is about the curse of too much freedom, and then we will look first at the gift of freedom, secondly, the abuse of freedom, and then finally, the curse of freedom. The nation of Israel has a remarkable, remarkable history. The Lord had given them much. They were chosen to be God's special people. As such, they were greatly blessed and given many wonderful promises. He promised them a land flowing with milk and honey, and he promised them a Messiah, the Savior of the world, who would be born from their nation. 
and throughout their history, the Lord God was with them. And the people were well aware of this, and they knew their history, and they had that, they had that history passed on from generation to generation. They knew about their father Abraham and the great promises to him and his descendants. The Lord God had promised Abraham that he would give them and his offspring the land of Canaan, and he did. Many places in Canaan reminded them of the fulfillment of those promises. One of those places is mentioned here in the text. Verse 15 speaks about beth as you will see in a moment, that actually refers to Bethel. And Bethel has quite a history in Israel, for it was there that God promised Abraham to give him and his descendants, the land of Canaan. Bethel was also where Jacob encountered God after he fled from his father-in-law, Laban. God revealed himself there to Jacob as the God of Bethel. And Jacob also built an altar there because of that wonderful revelation. And Bethel was also one of the three cities to which Samuel would come each year to make sacrifices and to judge the people. And so the people knew that history very well. They knew what Bethel stood for. And the text also mentions the town of Gilgal. Also, that place was well known to the people. It too had quite a history. Gilgal was situated between Jericho and the Jordan and was the first place God's people came to and stayed at after they crossed the Jordan. What a time of joy that was. Israel had been waiting for that for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness. Finally, they were in the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised to Abraham and his offspring some 600 years before. God had kept his promise. And Gilgal is the first place where they erected memorial stones to the Lord to commemorate that momentous event. Right after this, Gilgal became Joshua's base of operations as they went into the land of Canaan to conquer it. And some 400 years after that, Saul also used that town for the same purpose, for it was from Gilgal that he would attack the Philistines. And so Gilgal had become an important political, religious, and military center in the early monarchy. Gilgal was also one of the other cities that Samuel included in his yearly circuit. And so these two cities, Bethel and Gilgal, reminded Israel of the marvelous events of the past. The Lord God had shown his mercy to them, and he had taken them from all the other nations, giving them a land flowing with milk and honey. He had rescued them from their enemies in most miraculous ways. They had even been given great freedom to enjoy everything that God had given them. This also brought to mind a way that it was in paradise before the fall into sin. Every enjoyment imaginable was available there to Adam and Eve. God had given Adam and Eve total freedom to enjoy his creation. The Lord even made Adam and Eve his representatives on earth. They had been given the freedom to go and do whatever they wanted. In so doing, they had to give glory to God. But Adam and Eve scorned their freedom. They rebelled against God. They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and disobeyed God. They did not want to be constrained in any way. They disdained the freedom that they had and wanted even more. And that's the way it's ever been ever since, brothers and sisters. God continued to give God's people freedom 
but they disobeyed, they disobeyed him throughout their history. And rather than pointing fingers at others, let's also look at us, for isn't that the way we are as well? We too don't like to be constrained. We disobey his commandments all the time. We've done that also in this past week. We do it all the time. And it's good that the Lord God forgives us and that he continues to bring us back to him. Otherwise, you and I would be utterly lost as well. And, but that is why he warns us. Because if we keep on wandering away and do not want to be drawn back, then we will be lost forever. And now here in the text, he warns the Israelites. The second point. The Lord says to them, Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to Bethaven. Why would they not be allowed to go up to Gilgal now, the place with that beautiful history? Well, because of the kinds of things that were happening there. For do you know what was happening in Gilgal since the early monarchy? And Gilgal had become a place of idol worship. Instead of being a place where God was remembered for his wonderful deeds, Gilgal became a place of idolatry. In that historic city, they worshipped the fertility gods of the heathens. They brought in male prostitutes, and they gave vent to their base passions. They even sacrificed their own children to those heathen gods. Can you imagine? It was horrible. And Bethaven, well, as I said, Bethaven was another name for Bethel. The word Bethel means house of God. But Hosea changed the name to Bethaven. That word means house of evil. The people that Hosea addressed knew very well that he was referring to Bethel. Bethel had become a curse as soon as Jeroboam became the first king of the ten northern tribes of Israel that split away from Judah. And one of the first things that Jeroboam did was to set up the golden calf there. Jeroboam also established a new priesthood to serve there in Bethel. And he came with a new religious calendar as well. He rewrote the way the Israelites worshipped. Why would he do that? Well, for one thing, to make it easier for the people, so that they would not, so that they would could worship him in the way that suited them best, so that they did not have to go up to Jerusalem, which was enemy territory in Judah. Now they could stay within the boundaries of the ten northern tribes and worship God at Bethel. And in so doing, Jeroboam watered down the true religion. He changed it to suit his purposes and that of the people. He wanted to broaden the boundaries of God's laws. He wanted to give them greater freedom than God had given them. That suited him better. And that's why the Lord says to Israel, Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to Bethaven. They must stay away from those places where the Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, is not served. Because if they don't stay away and continue to engage in their heathen practices, they will be swallowed up by the rest of the world and become lost and, and utterly destroyed. And then he also adds something else. He says, and do not swear as the Lord lives. Why would he say that? Well, that's one of God's greatest complaints with his people. For although the people say that they are conducting themselves in accordance with God's will, and even swear by his name, in reality, they do nothing of the sword and instead worship other gods. They're idol worshipers. They lie and cheat and manipulate the truth so that they can live and worship in the way that they want. 
In so doing, they despise God. Brothers and sisters, the bedrock of relationships is that you are true to your word. You keep the promises you make to God and to each other. And that's also how God established his relationship with us. He made promises. He made the wonderful promise in paradise already after the fall into sin that he would defeat Satan on our behalf. And he kept that promise through Jesus Christ. He promised to forgive us our sins and to give us eternal life because he dearly loves us, which is why he established a covenant relationship with us wherein he reveals himself as the groom and refers to his covenant people as his bride. The church is the bride of Christ. And you find that imagery throughout the Scriptures. Can you imagine if our God would not be true to his word? Then you and I would be lost, wouldn't we? God is the God of promise, but he also expects us to be children of the promise. When we promise to serve him for all of our life, as we did at the time of our public profession of faith, he expected us to do our best to keep that promise. And when we promise to be faithful in our human relationships, such as our marriage vows, he also expects us to keep those promises. Also at times when that isn't easy. The Israelites weren't doing any of that. They did not keep their promise to love God and their neighbor as themselves. They flagrantly broke their marriage vows and did what was good in their own eyes. They suppressed the weak and the poor in society. There was no justice. The rich and all those in power made sure that they would have justice only for themselves. They didn't care about others. It was an abomination in the sight of God. And so, you see, the Israelites stepped outside the boundaries that God had set. Ultimately, that means that they worshipped themselves. Brothers and sisters, we see that same kind of thing all around us, don't we? We live in a world that makes up its own gods and worships them. The people worship the gods of fertility as you find them in the stock exchanges, big businesses, and large unions. This world worships fame and success and money. They worship themselves. And they want to, to have the freedom to do whatever they like. If a pregnancy is inconvenient, well, terminate it. Do you want to break your wedding vows for no good reason? Go ahead. Do you want to have sex with whomever you feel like? Go for it. Let nobody stop you. There is no end to the perversion that is practiced and promoted in this day and age. And it's getting worse and worse. At one time, this used to be a nation built on Christian principles. It no longer is. What happened? Well, little by little, the people wanted more freedom. They nibbled at this and a little bit at that, and they wanted more. They stepped outside of the boundaries that God had set, and more and more they walked away from the Good Shepherd. And the Lord God warns against that. He warns you and me Brothers and sisters, he also warns you, boys and girls, he warns us all, young, old, middle-aged, not to start nibbling on the other side of the fence. He tells you and me to get our fill close to the Good Shepherd, to God. He may not always feed us with food that we like, but you know that it will be good food, not junk food. Only the food and drink he gives you has all the right spiritual nutrients. Don't wander away from him. You can start very innocently. For example, 
regarding where you worship. You say to yourself, well, uh, it doesn't matter that much what church I go to or even if I go to church at all. You know, there's people in the church I don't like too much and, uh, and they're giving me a hard time about certain things. So why not I go to another church and, you know, I worship God there. I'm a Christian and I should have the freedom to worship wherever I feel most comfortable. I can serve God wherever I like, can't I? And I don't need others to keep me accountable, do I? Do I need that kind of hassle? And that's the kind of self-serving worship Hosea is warning against. For that is what Israel was preaching, was practicing. They were no longer holding each other accountable, and they wandered away from the truth a little bit at a time. They went further and further afield. First, Israel set up their worship in Bethel and Dan, where they pretended to be worshiping the Lord God, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. But they worshipped him through the golden calf. They went back from bad to worse. Israel wanted to taste the things of the world. They thought that as God's people, they had the freedom to do so. In the end, you could hardly recognize their form of worship. They became just like the world around them. And brothers and sisters, is that also what you and I are about? What are the kinds of things that you are nibbling on right now? I don't know. Are you greedy for money and you want to go for after the lottery tickets? Well, what's next? Casinos? Once you get addicted, you can't. You can lose everything that you own. And what about soft drugs? Do you know what that often leads to? Hard drugs. And alcohol, oh sure, it's okay to have the occasional drink, but it should never lead to binging, drunkenness. Eventually, that can lead to alcoholism. And sex, well, what's wrong with looking at a little bit of pornography here and there? Why can't I nibble at that? Everybody else is doing it. And it's so readily available. What's wrong with sleeping with my boyfriend or my girlfriend? Really? Is that so bad? The whole world does it. Sex outside of marriage, however, has all kinds of dire consequences. Don't make promises you have no intention of keeping. And that's what the Israelites did. And God curses them for it. Even though they swore that they were serving God and the things that they were doing, it was far from the truth. Do you know how you recognize a Christian, a genuine Christian? That's a person who is serious about the promises that he makes. He is serious about the kind of life that he wants to lead. He is serious in wanting to please God and his fellow man. He does his utmost to be reliable. He does his utmost to keep God's laws. Oh, sure, we fall all the time. I do too. We fall back into the same sins time and again. Not that we want to. Not because we don't love the Lord. It is because of our sinful flesh. And that is why Paul says in Romans 7, the very thing I hate is what I do. And time and again, day in, day out, we fall into the same sins. Paul says, O oh, wretched man that I am. But he also says further, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Indeed, brothers and sisters, and that's the comfort that we may have. Without Jesus, we're all lost. And he cleared a path for us to follow. He removed all the obstacles to our final destination with God in heaven. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the good shepherd. And that means we also have to walk in his path and follow in his footsteps. And so we still need boundaries. And those boundaries are there to keep you and me close to the Good Shepherd. 
And if we wander into wrong territory and do not turn back and keep on wandering away and don't hear His voice anymore, well, in the end, that will be the death for us. Let's think about fish in a tank. Those who have an aquarium will know that you had better keep a lid on your tank, for fish have been known to jump right out of the tank. They want to go beyond their boundaries. But you know what happens to a fish outside of an aquarium, don't you? It perishes. It needs its confines. The walls of the aquarium keep them safe. And why should they go outside of it? Within that aquarium, they have everything that they need. Well, that's also the way it is with us as God's children. God set boundaries for us. He has given us the Ten Commandments. That's why it's such a blessing that every Sunday morning you hear those Ten Commandments to be reminded. Do you know, do you want to go beyond those boundaries? Well, then you put your life in peril. If you don't want to keep on turning back, if you don't want to keep on asking God for forgiveness and to get you on the right path. In verse 15, Hosea says, Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Hosea addresses Israel here, the ten northern tribes. But he is speaking to her as if he is standing before a whore, as if he is standing before an outcast. And what does he do as he addresses her? He compares her to her sister Judah. He says to Israel that he is warning Judah not to associate with Israel because Israel has become bad news. She has wandered away from her first love from the Lord God himself. Israel has gone completely beyond the boundaries that God has set and has no intention of coming back. And so he says to Judah, I have nothing to do with her. Israel has been given a curse from God. And you know what that curse is? The curse is that he will give them all the freedom that they want. The third point. He says, like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. But then he asks, can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? That's what a lamb wants, doesn't it? He wants to have a, as broad a pasture as possible. And that's what the people of Israel want as well. They want God to pasture them there, to feed them. But they want them to do that in as broad a place as possible. They want God to make their pasture as great as possible. And they ask, God can take care of us anywhere, can't He? After all, He is the Good Shepherd. Will He not pasture us wherever we are, whatever we are doing, and wherever we are grazing? Isn't that what God promised? Yes, He did. But He also promised something else. He promised that those who do not want to stay within God's laws, within the boundaries of His great love and care, will end up in the domain of the devil. Because outside of the boundaries that God has set, the devil lurks. Brothers and sisters, do you know where a lamb belongs, a sheep? It belongs to its own flock. It belongs under its own shepherd. It cannot survive in wide open places. A lamb is one of the most helpless creatures you'll find. Such an animal lacks sense, and therefore it needs to be kept away from such things as poisoned plants. It must be kept away from the dangers lurking in the rough landscape. It needs to be warned and protected against wild animals. A lamb will be safe only within its own flock, with its own shepherd. Outside of that, the lamb will perish. It's also what it is for you and for me. Outside of the flock, you run the danger of perishing. And that's why you belong here in church, not in a church where God's Word is not taken seriously, where you are not given warnings about wandering away from the truth, where there is no discipline. 
Israel would not listen. It would not listen to a prophet such as Hosea who came with God's warnings. Israel wanted the freedom to roam wherever it felt like. In the end, Israel no longer heard the voice of the shepherd. And so what does God say to them? He says, well, if that's what you want, then you can have it. Go for it. Do what you like. Follow your heart. I have set you free. You don't want to listen anyway. I will give you the freedom. But that freedom is going to destroy you. Hosea was not the only one who gave that warning to Israel. Amos said the same thing. He said sarcastically in chapter 4, verse 4, Come to Bethel and transgress to Gilgal and multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. A parent may say that to a rebellious child at one point as well. To a child who has come of age and who doesn't want to listen any longer to his father and mother, who still lives at home, and who, but who wants to get drunk all the time and who uses drugs and no longer wants to attend church. If that's what you want, well, then you can have your freedom. Go. Go out into the world, but hopefully you'll come to your senses, and then you will come back to me, and then I will embrace you again. But if not, you're on your own. I can't help you anymore. You're not willing to listen. Do you think that would not hurt a parent to say something like that? Oh, yes. But a responsible and caring parent will lovingly say exactly that. And do you not think that it hurt God to have to say this to the nation Israel? The apple of his eye? Of course it did. But God does not compel Israel to worship her, nor any of us. He gives us a choice. Joshua says in chapter 24, Choose whom you will serve, the God of your fathers or the God of the Egyptians. Choose. God didn't make us like puppets on, a celestial, on celestial strings or as pre-programmed computers that will automatically obey their master's command. No, he wants us to worship him from the heart. And that sometimes means that he has to let you go. If you truly love him and see what the world has to offer, where in the end you will find nothing but slavery and misery and the pursuit of emptiness, then you will come back to him, just like the prodigal son in the parable. And that is what God was hoping. Israel was sent into, ex into exile to Babylon and other countries. And that was the broad place where they were sent. And there God's people became part of the heathen world. Oh, sure, God still shepherded them there. And God will also do that when we walk away from God and His people. But in the world, it becomes harder and harder to hear His voice above the roar of the world. In the end, you won't hear His voice anymore. In exile, the Israelites were able to have their synagogues and to read their their Bibles and sing their psalms. By and large, however, most Israel, most of those ten northern tribes became lost. There were only very few people that came back from the prom to the promised land. By and large, Israel became lost. Why? Because she brought upon herself the curse of too much freedom. There's an English saying that goes, if you give a child enough rope, he will hang himself. That was the curse of Israel. Israel is compared to an unwilling cow who does not want to be pulled along on the rope, but who wants to be free from its yoke. God's presence stifled them. Does God's presence stifle you sometimes? Do you want to play loose and fast with his laws? Do you want to nibble beyond God's boundaries? It's sometimes too stuffy for you in the church. Be careful. The reality, of course, is that we all like our freedom. 
And therefore, we do not keep God's laws as carefully as we should. And so it is wonderful that we have that good shepherd. As he says in verse 16, he does, he does continue to feed us and pasture us, even when we graze outside of God's boundaries. He does not easily let us go. He pulls us back. He forgives us our sins when we come to Him, and when we come to our senses time and again. And But you must also allow Him to pull you back time and again. And you know who that great shepherd is, don't you? That good shepherd. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how He revealed Himself, and we are His sheep. Know the voice of that shepherd. Shepherd, brothers and sisters, listen to him as he pulls you back from the brink of disaster. And he will feed you, and he will give you drink, he will comfort you, and he will heal you. As long as you go back to him time and again, he will take care of you. Brothers and sisters, with the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find true freedom. We need Jesus time and again to escape from the devil to escape from this world full of greed and lies and cruelty and broken promises and sexual immorality. We need to flee for safety to the Good Shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, through prayer, through repentance, by applying the Word of God in our lives and in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, seek your physical and spiritual well-being with Him. Graze in the pastures that He gives you. Only that food is truly delicious and wholesome. Only within his pasture will you be truly free, free forever. Amen.
let us give thanks in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are our God and that you warn us, that you love us enough to warn us not to wander away from you. For you are all wise and all knowing, and you have revealed yourself in your word as the Almighty God who has created us in all things, and you know what is best for us. And Father, teach us time and again to stay close to you, that when our flesh wants us to do one thing and you want us to do another, that we do not allow the flesh to dictate our actions, but that we allow your Holy Spirit in our hearts to guide us and, Lord, and to bring us back time and again when we sin and when we take wrong steps, oh Lord, and to cleanse us. Father in heaven, you know us. You know the struggles that we have in our lives. And, Lord, you know everything about us. And you, we ask you to, to guide us, especially when we are struggling with sins that have such a hold on us. When we live in those sins, Lord, Give us freedom, freedom from that slavery so that we may freely graze in your pastures, Lord, and grant that we may also find the help to be able to do that, the help from you and the help from loving brothers and sisters in the Lord, O Lord, that we may help one another as we stumble along and that we may pick one another up. Lord, bless us and bless us as church community. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may now bring your offerings to the Lord, and then afterwards we will sing from Psalm 68 to stanzas 3 and 12.
brothers and sisters, receive now the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.